Okay, here we go. We're recording. I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual folk arts narrative stage. And my name is Mark Brown with the Kentucky Arts Council. I'm the Folk and Traditional Arts Director, and I manage the Folk and Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Grant. Today is Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. And I'm here with recipients of the Folk and Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Grant for this fiscal year, Tommy Case and his apprentice, Daniel Graham. Tommy and Daniel are instrument makers, and they've come at it from, from different ways, but they're working together. Tommy as the mentor and Daniel as the apprentice. And uh, they've received their um, apprenticeship grant uh, for their project, which began in July of this year and will end in June of next year. So we're sort of at the midpoint, almost the midpoint actually, of their apprenticeship. And so this will be an exciting time to check in with them, see how it's going, what they've learn from each other so far and, and where, they, where they plan to take this. Uh, but also I wanna learn a lot about their, their backgrounds and how they got interested in luthery. Now luthery is a term a lot of people may not be familiar with. Um, and musicians tend to know it, especially string musicians. And um, it's a, just a term that means someone who makes or works on stringed instruments. Anything from guitars, violins, banjos, uh, fiddles, and um, what, what do you all think about that definition? Is there anything you'd, you'd add to that? Of what is a luthier? No, I agree. I think that's what it is. Yeah. It also includes a crazy person a little bit from what I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying you have to be crazy to be a luthier? <laughs> There's something that's missing. It's like, um, I know my grandfather was a clock repairman, and, um, and to work on clocks or instruments, there has to be something that's just not quite right. Okay. Uh, you. <laughs> and and I mean, joking, but also put aside, it is true. There's there's something that's very specific, and um, we can get into this later. But I, I think that's part of you know seeing how Tommy works has been really amazing because he'll see stuff that I have, I don't see at all. You know, he'll show me he's like right here. You got to look at right here. I'm like, yeah, I didn't see that. Like you know, and, and it's a very specific eye and it's a specific slant of perspective. And I think to be a luthier or anything with that kind of detail, whether it's in your ear or hand, something has to be just different for you, you know? That's great, great point. Um, so just, just so people understand where we are today, I'm calling in from my home in Frankfurt, but you all are in Georgetown on Georgetown College campus, is that right? And you're Correct. in the, go ahead. I know, I'm, I'll say, I'm in the, uh, the Wilson Fine Art Building and uh, Tommy and I are separated. I'm actually in a different room here. And uh, he's set up in my studio in my office down the hall. Um, so that's what we have here today. That's why I have the nice backdrop. And he just, yeah. Not. <laughs> Definitely looks like an active uh, environment there. Like a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's a busy place, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. The, not just the college campus, but I always have a laugh. People come to my office, and some people love it and some people hate it. But uh, some people come in, they're like, this is amazing. It's like there's so much to look at. And, and some people come in, they're like, this place stresses me out, you know, and um, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate his office because it's almost as messy as mine, <laughs> but close to it. You know, I, I used to visit, visit Homer Ledford's uh, workshop and you'd come in if you had something worked on and it was stacked up over in the corner like a violin in a case and he made dulcimers and he used a sander and um, he'd have to get a blower out and blow the dust off of your instrument and stuff before he could give it to you and you could pay. Him. But uh, his, his shop was really something. And I think that's a characteristic of anybody that does woodworking. You know, they sort of make their environment their own where things are handy and not put up like my wife likes, you know, where I can't find them. Everything's <laughs> laying out where I can access it. That's right. I'm so glad you brought that up, uh, Tommy and Daniel. That's, uh, that's a great point about the, uh, um, you know, an artist designing their own workspace and for whatever works for them. And uh, I'm glad you brought up Homer Ledford too. I've, I've actually been, I was in his basement um, a couple of years before he passed away and remember that, uh, that atmosphere from, it's floor to ceiling and you could have things he could pull down from the ceiling. Like a, he had a, I think a saw that he pulled down from the ceiling when he needed it and then he could put it back up when he was not using it. Right. Um, and so sort of that, uh, talk, can you talk about how uh, 
making your space work for you um, is important. Um, what, what would we see that's different in your shop, Tommy, if we were there right now? Uh, well, part of it is storage. Um, and so it's a, it's a mix of storage area plus workshop. But I have one area where I have everything set up, really not for general woodworking, but just to make violins. So I have the equipment in the front part of the room, my bandsaw, um, uh, planer, uh, sanders, and that kind of thing, all the big stuff. But back in the back, I have everything set up in detail where you can move from one side of the room, whether you're bending wood or doing work on a, a violin, like setting up a bridge or something like that. I have all the tools and stuff. And of course, Daniel's just like my grandson. He comes in, he sees it one time. He knows where everything's at. They know better than I do where stuff is at. He and the other apprentice that I had yeah. learned the shop in about five minutes and they're in there getting out things and working on stuff before I even get started. So it's been really interesting and really enjoyable, you know, to have them be a part of this. That's a great point. And uh, you talked about kind of with all, you kind of touched on all the different processes involved in uh, making an instrument from scratch. There's so many different steps um, I'm sure that we'll talk about, but to have your, to have your workspace be sort of, um, flexible, I guess, or adaptable, so you can work on different aspects of the instrument at different times. Is that something that's important to you? Yep, it is. It is. Having everything, having it easily accessible, you know, so that you can move from one point to the other. Because when you're working on something, you can never tell whether you might need a, uh, this tool or that one or whatever. Having everything accessible, I think, is really important, you know, and uh, again, out where I can see it rather than store it away. <laughs> I think I'd like to get this document sent to my wife as well so that she can understand <laughs> that, like that's how it functions because I yeah. think my wife Holly and his wife Patty could get together and tell some good stories because um, yeah I think the artist workshop like Tommy said I don't know how Tommy does it though because my my shop I know is set up for me to do all the ADHD stuff that I do in art you know, everything from a violin to wood carving to printmaking to whatever. Um, but Tommy has more order than I do in a couple of areas. Um, you know, he's, he has, you know, he's doing multiple working on multiple parts. So when he's working on his violin, he's at a different stage than I am. You know, we're very close, but we're, he's like kind of one step ahead. And so uh, he'll pull out different tools or different setups and stash them away and pull them out every time we kind of need them. So he's got this really great, in my opinion, great organization of where things go, you know. It seems very natural. I guess that's why me and John could learn it really easily because it's one of those things where you kind of like, where would I put it? Well, it looks there and that's where it is. You know, it's, it's, it's set up well. Right. Sort of an external uh, organizing of your, of your internal thought process yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to talk about more about tools um, in a minute, but uh, first I'd like to ask each of you, um, sort of your background um, in Luthery, how you came to be interested in um, music in general, but also specifically in um, working on instruments, building instruments, um, and, and kind of how you came to where you are right now. So Tommy, I've, I know you've told me your story a couple times before at least, but I pretend like I'm hearing it for the first time. I'd like for uh, people to get a sense of, you know, how you got into the, uh, how you got into this traditional art form. Okay, well, um, when I was 40, uh, I, I wanted to start learning an instrument. I was uh, enthralled with uh, Ricky Skaggs and some of the traditional music that I would see at bluegrass festivals. I'd go to bluegrass festivals and I'd go back up in the back of the park and there'd be these guys playing old fiddle tunes and so forth. And I knew there was a difference. It was old time music, it was traditional music. And that was really what I was interested in. So um, I guess in 1987, I started taking uh, music lessons from Wanda Barnett and Raymond McLean in the Richmond and Berea area. About the same time, I started collecting old violins. I would go to the flea market or an antique show or whatever. And, um, invariably when you collect an old instrument it would need to be repaired 
So I developed a relationship with luthiers around in central Kentucky, uh, whether it was Homer Ledford or uh, Bill Huckabee down in Frankfurt. And I would take these instruments to them and um, uh, they would do repairs. And I learned just a little bit over time. But I, I really developed a good relationship with Bill Huckabee down in Peaks Mill in Frankfurt. And um, in his situation, he made violins. He made about 50 violins during his retirement, a couple of cellos and so forth. And right at the end of the last four or five years of his life, he, he, he wanted to take on some apprentice. And so myself and a guy named Lucian Parker from down to Frankfurt, we went into this venture together. And he helped us make our first violin. And then he was a mentor for the next two or three years. And so um, in addition to just learning how to make one, I'd been working state government for 47 years. That's how long my career was down there. But when I finished up, I wanted some kind of hobby, something that I could work on until, the, until I'm ready to leave here. And uh, that was what I saw with Bill and with this. And since I love fiddles and violins and, and mandolins, you know, I said, this is an opportunity that I don't want to miss. So I went through that process with him. And then also another apprenticeship with uh, Art Mize over uh, uh, a year long apprenticeship with him. And that's the process where I learned. So um, then, and I think I told this story before with Bill Huckby, I had told him several times and his wife that if I ever found some young folks that were really interested in, in this, I would want to pass that on, which you know should be done with anybody that learns a little bit about something and thinks it'll be beneficial to others. So that's how I came to this and why I'm interested in been participating in the grant program that you all, got, you all offer. That's great. Let me ask, uh, when you first met, say, Bill Huckabee, um, was there a time of, uh, you know, getting to know him? Was he, um, was he hospitable? Was he like welcoming you at the beginning or, or did it take some time for y'all to um, sort of develop some uh, kind of maybe friendship or respect for one another so that he was ready to share information with you? Yeah, well, I mean, he was an engineer from General Electric, so he was sort of crusty, you know, uh, but we got along, we got along well, and I had to, like, um, and Daniel talks about, he has a natural art and feel for wood and so forth, but in my situation, and he talked about ADHD, I have some of that, I have a project, a background in project management at state government and information technology, so I was always in a, you know, involved in command and control and so forth. And I had to really learn myself to slow down and not skip uh, steps in the process and so forth. And so uh, that was a big, the adjustment was more for me than it was for Bill. But he, he and I developed, I think, a pretty close relationship uh, over time. And uh, we, we still miss him now that he's gone on. Why do you think that was important? Uh, did he bring up the idea of you, um, you know, sharing what you learned from him to, to a new generation? Yeah, he, he did. I, and, and like I say, I just, I mentioned that to him right at, right toward the end. And I, I really think he worked up until two or three, two or three weeks before he passed away. Wow. And that's the thing about uh, violin making or instrument making. If you have a shop, you can do a little piece, you can walk away and you can come back. And so uh, we did, we talked about that two or three times that uh, all of his expertise, and we had the opportunity, the solution Parker and I, to actually purchase a lot of his tone wood, and some of his smaller tools, all of his templates that we use and so forth and so on. So it was really beneficial. And I think he realized that was gonna be put to good use, not just stored in a cabinet after he was gone. That's great. And you mentioned um, learning alongside, uh, is it Lucian Parker? Yeah. Um, is it, what is it like learning, um, you know, along with uh, someone else who's kind of coming to it at the same time you are? Well, I, I think it's more enjoyable because there's like healthy competition and 
one person. Of course, we can't keep up with Daniel with all his carving expertise and everything. But anyway, uh, I think that's that makes it enjoyable. And if you run into some kind of challenge, you can talk with somebody that you know has already experienced that. And so I, I think it's a nice thing to build a little community around these apprenticeships and people that are interested in this. And uh, because other luthiers here in Central Kentucky really can't make much money, um, you know, actually building a violin because of all the time and effort that goes into it. Most of the money is made on restorations and set up and that kind of thing for luthiers. You know, I'm talking about the violin side. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so anyway, uh, that, that, that's the process and so forth. It goes on. Are you still in touch with Mr. Parker? Or? Oh yeah. Lucian. Yeah. yeah. He is, he is even more interested in arts. He's, he's done pottery and painting and actually has a showing going on. Um, John Harrod's wife, uh, Tona, mm-hmm. uh, she has some kind of show up in Lexington at one of the venues. And uh, the, it was the art was based around uh, art that, that you can play or whatever. And Lucian had some pieces that he contributed for that, that showing that she has going on up there in Lexington. Nice. nice. OK. Well, thank you, Tommy. I, I want to hear from you, too, Daniel. Uh, tell us about your background. Um, now, I know you've got a lot of experience as a woodworker and a visual artist, too. So talk about that and kind of how, um, how that um, led to your your path of, of discovery now with uh, instrument making and, and repair? Well, it's an odd story, so bear with me because it's a little it's a little disjunctive. Um, so I grew up in a military family and uh, my dad was like a fix it kind of guy. Um, you know, I have these memories of my entire life that we never bought anything, but we always took things apart, you know, so like I have vivid memories of like multiple dishwashers being taken apart into all their pieces, you know, to like repair one thing. Um, I mean, the same thing, like just a week ago, the little spout in our refrigerator broke and everybody's like, oh no. And I'm like, well, let's take it apart and figure it out. You know, like that's just how I grew up. And my mom was a basket maker and a calligrapher. So I was kind of always around creativity and kind of fix it like my entire life. And, um, And so I wanted to be an engineer when I was growing up because I had an uncle who was cool and he was an engineer, you know, and you know how that is. You're like, oh, that guy's awesome. And he does cool stuff. And, um, and then I got into college thinking I wanted to do engineering and then I realized what kind of math I'd have to take. And I was like, yeah, I'm done. Like not interested. Like, um, <laughs> so I, I realized what I liked about engineering was the, the creative side of it, uh, where it is, but I don't want to like have to know how it's made, you know, at, at that level of things. And so um, I got into the art department at the university of Florida and, um, and then I had a bad instructor. I got into a fight with a t- teacher um, during a critique and uh, I was a graphic design major. And she was like, basically you can leave and change your major. And I was like, fine. And I, cause I was kind of a rude kid. So I went in uh, and I was in this printmaking class with a crazy man. Like he talked to sheep, he's kind of out there wild. And um, so I loved that class. And so I went and changed my major to printmaking. And I came back in and slapped my form down the table. I was like, well, I'm a printmaker now. And then I leaned over to my friend. I was like, what do printmakers do? Because I don't even know. Like, you know, just um, so I changed my major to printmaking. And then I ended up getting two degrees in printmaking. Um, and so I have a traditional degree in stone lithography from, um, from University of Florida. And then I went and got my master's in printmaking at the University of Georgia. And um, but all along kind of doing experimental installation art kind of pieces. And, um, but between the two formal educations, um, I worked in the summers at a local frame shop in Washington, DC, where my folks live. And so this wood shop, it was on a military base and it had a custom wood shop, a frame shop, a quilting studio and a photography studio. It was like this little art center. And um, the guy that ran it was like an old art guy from the sixties. He was super cool. We got along really well. And um, he came up to me one day, he goes, Hey, good news, bad news. I was like, what's up? He said, well, bad news is uh, our custom woodworker is leaving. And I was like, oh no, Ryan's great. I was like, what's the good news? He's like, "Uh, you're going to be the new one. And I was like, (laughs) I don't know anything. He's like, yeah, but I can tell you'd love it. And like, I'd rather work with you and use you as an apprentice for a while than hire someone I don't know. And I was like, okay. 
And so for two years, I was a custom furniture maker in downtown DC under this guy, learning everything, you know, that I could. And um, so I've always brought those kind of things to what I do in art, you know, whether they're highly crafted kind of furniture pieces or something else. And, um, but then I moved to Kentucky. And so I'm not from Kentucky. The only reason I stopped in Kentucky was for gas, like before now. And so I came here, um, moved to Georgetown for this job at Georgetown College, which I love. And, um, but now I've lived here 14 years. And uh, after a year, I think it was like 12, I was like, this sounds so awful, but bear with me. I was sitting there and I thought, well, I'm kind of from Kentucky, so I should at least know how to play the banjo. And I don't know why that made sense. I don't know why. I never met anybody with a banjo. It just made sense. And um, so, but then I thought, well, maybe I mean guitar. Maybe I'm thinking guitar. And so I borrowed a guitar to learn to play. And I held it and I thought it was gross. I was like, I don't like the way this feels. I don't like anything about it, but I want to make one. Like that was in my brain. So I told my friend that I was borrowing the guitar from, hey, I want to make a guitar. He said, don't. I said, why? He said, uh, you want to make a banjo. I said, why? He said, because if you make a banjo and it's slightly off, it's a quirky, fun banjo. He said, if you make a guitar and it's slightly off, it's just a really bad guitar. And I was like, that makes sense, I guess. Um, so I ended up making uh, an Appalachian style mountain banjo from the Fox Fire books, like a lot of people do. And, um, and I thought I wanted to play bluegrass music, learned I don't like it. And, but I found old time music and I really enjoyed it. And I don't even know how I met John uh, John Reister. And honestly, I have to research that. I don't remember how I met him, but I met him. He lives like a mile from here. We became friends and he was starting the apprenticeship with Tommy. And so I started making banjos for myself that I love to play. And I learned, I traded a banjo for, to John for lessons to learn how to play. And all the while he kept talking about Tommy and how I have to meet Tommy. So I met Tommy and that's where it kind of came from. So I think violin seemed like something really exciting and something to kind of test my chops on um and it has done that it's really really good so i was gonna say uh there's these these are laying all over the <laughs> shop <laughs> this is just one that happened to be laying at my feet here in front of <laughs> tom you're not supposed to tell secrets man there's like four around your feet right now yeah uh, is that one of the foxfire style banjos or no up? The one to your right is, Tommy, the one on the right on the ground. That's a, that is a gourd style banjo I made out of a ceramic pot that I threw. Um, Cause I don't want, I don't, I don't have a green thumb, but I wanted to grow a gourd to make a gourd banjo, but that takes a long time. So I could throw a pot on a potter's wheel. So I just threw a pot and made it into a banjo. Um, Beautiful. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> Let me um, the Appalachian style ban banjo is on your right, Tommy. Um, yeah, that one. So that's an Appalachian style yeah. mountain banjo. Yeah. And then the um, Beautiful other one that's at his feet that's really funny is a canjo. It's like an old can, you know? Yeah, I'm familiar uh, with canjo, yeah. So I took this can, I don't know where that one's sitting. Oh, that's not that one. Yeah, that one's a really interesting one. Um, on a banjo, you have a tone ring. Usually it's a metal ring. And I made that one out of uh, glass. It's a glass tone ring. Um, I had a friend of mine that's a glass blower. So we worked together to make that. Um, and so all sorts of fun stuff in them. Um, currently I am vetoed from making any more banjos because my wife thinks I have too many. And I was like, there's no such thing. Um, once again, I had to have her meet up with Patty and ask how many violins that Tommy owns. Um, but they're all so fun and different because it's, to me, it's not like a guitar. It's not so fine tuned. You can just make them different and interesting. Like the one he's about to grab is my primary player. Um, and I'd never seen a banjo with an inlaid fingerboard. So I actually inlaid the entire fingerboard of a woman jumping over a stool. That's his print background. Yeah. What is that, Tommy? I said that's his etching or printing background at work. So um, that is beautiful. I remember seeing this in your uh, work samples that when you submitted the application. It's like an animated, uh, like a stop motion almost uh, movie when you, when you look yeah. at it left to right or right to yeah. left, I guess. And I thought, Tommy, if you don't hold that back up, the neck, I, I thought it was interesting because it's this old photograph of the woman jumping over the stool, but when she jumps down is right where the peg goes, the fifth string peg. And so the neck gets really short there. And so if you have an image, it, it has to drape. And so I was like, what fits in that area? And so when I ended up figuring this out, I was like, 
that's perfect because she'll shrink down and actually before she stands back up that's where that kind of fits that's, exactly. yeah. that's beautiful design so how did you get uh, tell me again uh, how you got the image onto the um the uh, fingerboard there so the image is it's, it's inlay it's actually um the the black material that is there it's called rich light it's a paper product it's like an imitation ebony it's a sustainable ebony um, and I've actually etched that out and then inlaid in um, imitation mother of pearl acrylic that goes in there. And so each- Also heavy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a funny thing. I, I'm a big approval person about like, if you don't know what rules are, you can break them, right? Like, and so a lot of people will look at what I do sometimes. They're like, you shouldn't do that. And I'm like, I didn't know I shouldn't. So I did because I just don't know. And so in that one, I made my, everything on these banjos that you're seeing is made from scratch. I don't buy anything except for the head and the tuners. So the tone rings, the nuts, the bolts, everything is made from scratch. I machine everything, th make threads, everything. Um, and so anyhow, I don't know what a banjo feels like. I never owned one, right? So to learn on one, I had to make one. So I made it to what it feels right to me. Apparently banjos aren't heavy, but all of mine are because that's what felt right, right? So um, yeah, I, I just, I pick them up and that's what feels right. And then everyone's like, yours is heavy. I'm like, really? I was like, yours is light. It's like, I didn't know, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, there's, there's so much for me to follow up with there. Uh, so 99% uh, of the people that I know that um, if they start playing an instrument or, or get interested in playing an instrument would not say, I think I'm just going to make one. So <laughs> that's, I, I think that's one thing that makes you unique as a, as an artist and as a traditional artist. Um, and, and it, do you think it's partly because of all this, um, like this diverse, um, experience that you've had and, and woodworking and all your other media, um, plus, um, um, I don't know, is, is there something besides that? Uh, did, did you have a vision or what, what was your flame or motivation, I guess, to, to make one, if you could talk about that more? Well, I think, you know, um, going back to growing up, like um, my mom and I, we didn't grow up with a lot of money by any means. And I still don't have a lot of money. And that's a good thing. I think if I could buy a banjo, I wouldn't be as happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I can make a banjo cheaper than buying one. And so, but I grew up with this idea of, um, my mom and I would go to stores. We carry a little sketchbook. She taught me how to sew and make these sketchbooks we'd carry. And we would be like, we could do that. And we'd kind of, and once again, that fix it nature of taking something apart and knowing how it's made, we would kind of pick things apart and pretend to make them and know how to make them. And a lot of times we would go back and make things to ourselves. You know, we made a lot in my household growing up. Um, I mean, my mom sewed a lot of my clothes when I was young, you know, and mm -hmm. um, if you didn't have it, you either said, I don't need it or find a way to make it, you know, and kind of grew up um, in that time period where that was, in, that was valuable, you know, um, so my, my bit is that if I don't have it, I, I, this is natural instinct to make it, you know, to fix it or to do it. And, um, but also, yeah, that skill set. I, 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 you know, you recognize, you put all your tools out on the table. Like we were talking about uh, physical space being a shop where everything's accessible. There's also a mental shop that we all have where you have to set things down and see them all. And so if I can put down that I have all of my welding skills and machining skills and woodworking skills, why would I buy it? right? I could make it. And if I'm an artist, I could make it different. And that was important to me. I wanted it to look different. Um, Tommy, pick up that Kanjo next to you on the right, uh, on your right. It's got a, yeah. So this was one of the first ones I made. So I took an old paint thinner can and took the paint off and then put these uh, mug shots from the twenties on there. Wow. Uh, and that one was fun because, you know, it was a just a different experiment, but you don't see that anywhere. So you can't buy that, but mm -hmm. a lot of these people that have like kits or, you know, you could buy this cheap banjo. Mm -hmm. I'd just be happier making my own, you know, cause that skill set. It's beautiful. Can I hear that? Can you pluck a string on that, Tommy, so we can hear what it's on? Sure. I can't play the banjo. Wow, yeah. Sound we'll, good. We'll, we'll pull some out in a minute. We'll play them. I'll play a bunch of them. We'll, we'll, we'll see this sound like. Cool, okay. Wow. Um, now, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier, Daniel, about uh, getting into music and music communities in Kentucky. 
and you talked about you didn't like bluegrass music when you when you kind of were first getting to know that. Yeah, the old time music appealed to you. Uh, a lot of people may not understand that there is a difference between bluegrass and old time music. Could you talk about that? What what is the difference? Um, you know, in the musical communities you've met in Kentucky, uh, how would you describe bluegrass music versus old time music as an insider? I, I don't want to offend anyone. Um, and, and, and so this is just my personal experience. So caveat. Um, I, I thought I wanted to, like I said, I want to learn to play the banjo. There's a guitar class on campus, on the Georgetown College campus, and he's a great guitar teacher. And he said he could walk me through the first year of banjo. So we got this book and like bluegrass, whatever. And it's a lot of, the rhythms are a lot of, uh, put your right hand on autopilot, you know, like these little picking rhythms, and then your left hand does something else, and it feels disjunctive to me. It feels very, like, systematic to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it took me a semester to learn two songs, and I don't remember them. I just, I just, you know, not, I played them <laughs> once, and that was it. And then old-time music, though, it's this, you can feel the age of it, and that sounds odd, but, like, there's a rhythm that's part of our culture that we're not even aware of, you know? And so there's this deep seated kind of rhythm of naturalism in them that you can feel. And I don't know how to explain that, but like, um, and they're simpler, like the hand gestures are simpler in banjo in bluegrass. You pick it with fingers and the thumb. And you have to wear little finger picks. Um, I play claw hammer overhand style where you hold your hand like this and you actually strum differently. And it feels, it felt very natural to me. Um, and then, so I ended up learning a song a week for a year and I remember them versus two songs in five months, you know? Um, but something about it, it's this kind of, not say raucous, but like it's a communal music. Whereas bluegrass to me is a performer and a viewer. Um, old time music is everyone's performing. And so you can feel the community built into the music. Um, and I think, I think it's uh, string music is, is dance oriented as well. And, it, you know, people try to engage uh, the audience, you know, and especially if there's folks around that like to clog or dance, you know, to involve them in that. And there's just a feel that gets underneath my skin, you know, uh, I, that I enjoy. And that's, a, that's, that's, that to me is a big part of it. Yeah, I, that's uh, beautifully expressed, both of you. Right? And it's something you connected with at a, at a deeper level. and. Uh, as, as we know, bluegrass does have that kind of that technical style developed largely by Bill Monroe, but also um, uh, Earl Scruggs, his banjo player, his first banjo player, who right. their, their aesthetic or their value was play it as fast as you can and, and you know, as charged as you can. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, even though that, that genre that basically was developed by Bill Monroe um, is, is a, um, I think it's, related to in the family of music genres it's it comes out of an old time tradition um the same instruments anyway with string string instruments um but played a different way so um i think that's that's an important point i'm glad you were both able to talk about um you know what what that genre of old time or string music tommy as, as you said uh, means to you and and so for uh the people you hang out with in your music circles, are they mostly um, old time and string instrument players or string music players? For, for me, that's been true, yes. I mean, there's a whole community, as you well know, of folks that uh, play traditional music and um, uh, also involved in contra dancing and festivals, old time music festivals. <laughs> and and uh, to me, that's growing and even stronger now than it was back when I started having an interest, interest back in the 80s. Like I said, I would go to bluegrass festivals. So they had one at Big Hill in Richmond um, or outside of Richmond or Berea that the McLean family ran back in the 60s and 70s. And they would play bluegrass and even Bill Monroe and some of the old famous acts would show up at their festival. But what I liked was being played up on the hill up behind, and that was traditional fiddle tunes. And a lot of the performers that would bluegrass fiddlers would come up to that area and play old time uh, fiddle tunes uh, up there with just people in the park rather than the commercial stuff they were doing on the stage. 
And now in your all uh, application, Tommy, you all talked about the violin slash fiddle being an instrument that's very versatile, that can be played in a lot of different styles and genres. Now, what is it, um, would you say that if somebody comes to you looking for a repair or um, a setup, um, are you, are you going to ask them questions about their musical style and, and what are, I guess each player is different, right? But also each style of um, music is also different. So what are the different values between, say, someone who's playing uh, classical music in, in an orchestra or uh, someone who's playing in a country band or in, a, um, or in a, um, an old time um, ensemble or bluegrass group? Could you talk about like the different um, preferences for players? Absolutely. Uh, the the setup of the instrument is com usually not completely different, but quite a bit of difference. Uh, string players that play in an orchestra, the bridge is carved at a different angle. They don't play as many double stops, which means playing on two strings at one time. So um, the strings, uh, the <laughs> A traditional uh, player would probably buy a set of strings that would cost $50, you know, versus uh, if you're in an orchestra, there's only a few that are really acceptable. And they start at 75 up to a hundred and some dollars a set. Mm. So there's quite a bit of difference in that in the way the instrument is set up. Um, uh, usually folks that play traditional fiddle tunes, they want a violin that's more resonant, you know, that that, that is, can be heard because a lot of the playing is done outside where somebody that plays in an orchestra, they're really after the tone of the instrument because they're playing a lot more delicate music and so forth. And the precision that they play with is, is, a, is a lot different. It's not, I, I don't really have access. Most of the people I deal with come out of the folk and traditional music community but Art Mize, and there's a few luthiers that do have that real expertise, you know, in setting up an instrument for uh, someone plays in an orchestra. And it's very different, very different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about that? And, um, and I know you learning from Art and also from, you know, Art's um, um, teacher was J.B. Miller. Um, who I, did, did you get to meet, you mentioned JB, right? Did you get to meet him or not? Well, yes, uh, just briefly. I mean, Art, at the time I met him, um, I think uh, Mr. Miller was in his 90s. He had a shop there in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And Art was doing his apprenticeship, working for Mr. Miller yeah. before his passing. So I, I, did, I did meet him. And there was another luthier that a lot of people don't know about, but his name was Lonnie Miller, and he lived at California, Kentucky, which is up on the up on the river up in um, northern Kentucky. Really? And he was a very it would take him a long time to repair an instrument, uh, but he did work for the some of the folks that played in the orchestras, Cincinnati and up in northern Kentucky. But he was a fine instrument maker and luthier that uh, doesn't get a lot of notoriety, but he was, he was very, very good you know, at what he did at that time. He, he came from the mountains, moved up to Northern Kentucky, and then late in life before his passing, he moved back up to Eastern Kentucky. So he, he, was, he was another nice, nice fellow that was involved in this trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd also brought, brought up the point that, you know, we're just mentioning a handful of uh, the last generation of luthiers in, in central Kentucky. Um, and there, were, there really were only a handful, weren't there? That's exactly, that's exact. now that's uh, what I was exposed to, yes. That's so, true here in central Kentucky, yeah. So it seems like with so few um, people with that expertise and um, skill set that they would be in big demand because there's so many musicians in Kentucky. Um, young and old and, um, uh, and uh, from so many different genres and styles. And they, they all have, a, they have to know somebody, you know, they have to have their person that keeps their instrument sounding great. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's a position that's kind of, it's in demand. <laughs> Absolutely. There, I, I think like um, Old Town Violins in Lexington, um, 
there are some German uh, luthiers, I think, that go from one shop to the other. Uh, I'm not real familiar with who the fellow is that does repairs uh, up in uh, Lexington, but I do know that there are some folks that move around between different major violin shops and helping set up because a lot of a lot of these uh, uh, luthiers today um, in big shops, what happens with them, they get involved with orchestra programs at high schools and so forth. And so there's a lot of work when school starts taking all these fractional size, small violins and student instruments and getting them set up and uh, in playable condition when these schools start back. And so as, uh, as uh, more and more schools uh, develop string programs, I think there will be more and more demand for luthiers and people that know how to set up violins and string instruments. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's think about, um, with learning from Bill Huckabee and Art Mize, what are some of the um, characteristics of like a Central Kentucky luthier that you, that you learned and that you're kind of you're a representative of that tradition now. You're a tradition bearer in that you're passing on to Daniel. Um, are, there, um, are there things that set this region apart for those, for those kinds of artists? Or um, what, are, what were some of the values that, um, that Bill Huckabee felt were important for you to pass on to the next generation? Well, I, I, think, I think both Bill and Art, um, you know, they, 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 their personalities lend themselves to detailed work. I know with Bill and his engineering background and art is very, very, has a critical eye. And I mean the details and I mean his taking the time to do the work and so forth. I mean, both of them in their situation, it's not a learned skill as far as the detail work they come to it with that behavioral makeup in their personality. And uh, so I think that's, that's a big part of it because uh, you cannot, when you're working on an instrument, especially if it's a real valuable instrument for somebody plays in an orchestra or whatever, you can't, you can't take shortcuts. Everything has to be done with the finest precision. And uh, I think both of them uh, had that kind of uh, mentality. And I, I wasn't around Mr. Miller, J.B. Miller, but I think he was pretty much the same way, you know, as uh, when, they, when Art learned from him. So that's something that in turn you have to look for in your, in your students. Uh, and and talking, thinking about now uh, Daniel and, and John last year, um, is there, were there any clues that when you first met them that, that told you this, this one is going to be, this one's ready to learn? Well, both of them are great people to start out with. I mean, you know, they, they're uh, both really interested. Uh, John, uh, he, he is, I, I, I haven't been able to talk to his wife, you know, since he went through the apprenticeship, but he's gone completely fiddle crazy. You know, he's making violins right and left, and he has a presence out on the internet and people, you know, wanting instruments. And so he's, He's made four or five since last year when we started. And then of course, you know, Daniel's already proven to you with his artistic, he comes to it a little bit different, not just the basic functional side, but the artistic side. I think I showed you this earlier, you know, Daniel is working on two violins at the same time. And this is, a, this is an example of his carving of the neck for his second violin. He and I have uh, conversations about, I don't know how it's going to sound, as a sound because of the, uh, <laughs> the uh, top that he's putting on it, the wood. But uh, I tell him, this is your dad talking, you know. But uh, anyway, um, uh, he, he had comes to it from a completely different perspective. And, uh, and both of them have strengths one way or the other. Uh, John with his entrepreneurship and then Daniel with his... Uh, artistic expression and making the form, uh, the, the function and the form, you know, come together in something that should be exceptional when it's finished the way it looks. As long as it has a spruce top on it, it'll be exceptional. <laughs> hey, so you gotta, Mark, you gotta hear, I hear this every week and I have such a laugh because 
I'm committed to trying something that might fail, but I have to try it. And, and it, I, I have bets. I have strong bets that it's going to sound good. And then, but he'll still say, Tommy will still say, probably sound better with a spruce top on it. But um, yeah, I'm making a different wood for the top that no one ever uses. And there may be a good reason they don't use it, but I've made dulcimers out of the top and it sounds great. So oh. I'm curious. I don't know. We'll see. Are you allowed to tell us what that, what the material is or is that to be? Rude? Yeah. Um, well, Tommy, it's on the bench to your left. You'll see the case of it. Um, oh. It's ambrosia maple. And um, I can actually pull up. I'm doing a whole inlay piece on the back. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to take a long time. It's got close to 1,600 pieces in the inlay that fits on the back of a violin. Um, let me, I'll pull up a picture I can share on the screen if you guys want to see what it's going to look like. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let me pull that up. Um, this, this is back that he's constructed. This is the, this is the side, sides, which are conventional. This is, this is the way the wood is bent on all of them. But it's just different. This is a different maple than is conventionally used. And this is his experimental top. <laughs> but you can see it's really pretty. But we'll just have to see how it sounds. You know, we get that. Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But so the <laughs> back, the back of that one is walnut. It's gonna be darker. And um, I will hold on a second. I can actually. Can you share a screen? Let me know if you need Yeah, yeah just a second. If you want to um, allow it. This, this is the way it'll come together. And this is, this is maybe a little, uh, not to say too involved, but a little backdoor information here. Um, you got to host, uh, if you want to click the little button next to share screen, allow me to do it. I'll share it. Did I get it? I've got multiple can share. Okay. Yep, I got it. All right, so. It should go down. All right, so this is a an Audubon picture. Yeah. Um, and what I'm actually doing is redrawing these two birds. Um, one is a mockingbird, uh, the top one, and the other one's a thrasher. And so, um, and I'm giving this violin to my wife so we can both learn to play. So I'm playing the traditional one, and she's going to play this one. And she likes things that are softer, so I think not as harsh of a sound. So even if it is a slightly duller sound, I think it's going to be good. Um, but here's what the back of the violin is gonna look like. Um, you have this top bird, I've moved her up and he's down here. So they're kind of courting in some way, even though they're not the same. Um, but to, if you to understand, let me zoom in here. This is how I've had to reconstruct. So each of these little pieces is a separate piece of wood. And so I'll be actually creating the puzzle and then cutting each of these and then replacing them to, to build them in place and then inlay all of that into the back of that violin. Wow. And so this one's also gonna have that kind of curled leaf uh, scroll at the top. Um, so it'll be kind of extravagant in terms of what it looks like, um, but we'll see in terms of its success. Visually, I think I can pull it off, but it's really testing my chops in terms of um, cutting small, you know, finite pieces and different species and dyeing different woods and how that finishes and how that adds to the sound or not adds to the sound um, is going to be really interesting. So, and I, you know, along this thing, talking about, you're talking about Bill Huckabee, I can stop sharing my screen now. Um, so, but that's going to be done hopefully in the next, you know, few months. That's kind of what's looking like. Um, but I'll say like, you know, with Bill Huckabee and you were talking about not say a legacy, but things that you pass down. Um, this was brought up to me years ago. I had someone, we were talking about furniture and um, it started because we have a lot of, we have two kids and they were small at the time and kids have shoes and shoes go everywhere. I don't know if you have this experience as a dad, like, and so my wife came to me and she said, we need something for the hallway. Like right when you come in, we have a very tiny house. And so like you come in this hallway and she's like, we need something there to put shoes and sit down on. And I was like, okay. She's like, we need it by the end of the week. And I was like, why? She's like, if you don't make something by any week, I'm going to go to Target. And I was like, oh dear Lord, like don't, I'll just, I'll just, don't spend the money. I'll, I'll make something. And so I was making this thing and I was telling somebody what I was making. I'm like making little cubbies for my kids and little drawers and then like a little bench basically. And this person said, how do you feel about heirlooms? And I was like, heirloom style? No, no. They're like, no, no, no. They're like the stuff you're making 
your kids are going to fight over one day. And I was like, don't tell me that. Like, I have enough pressure in my life already. I don't need to like think about that. Um, because it is kind of true that like our objects will outlive us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know it's important to me. I know I'm putting it in the violins I'm making that I'm making them with Tommy Case. Not only because he's a friend of mine now as a mentor and just a friend, um, but also in 40 years when I'm telling my kids, this is the violin I made with Tommy and he's the one that taught me how to make this one. And he's the one that taught me how to make your mom's and that gets passed down with the object. And I think that goes back to old time music is that it's an oral tradition in a way you learn these styles from people and you learn these stories and the instruments are no different. You know, um, it's not like traditional music where there's one way to play it. You know, there's lots of variation. So, yeah, that that's my little metaphor is like, uh, that you put a message in a bottle and you throw it in the sea. You make a violin and uh, you put your name and information inside of it. And uh, hopefully a hundred years or, or more from now, you know, it'll show up somewhere. One of the violins that I made, I think it was in 2008, uh, I sold at a um, uh, string music festival up in West Virginia. I sold it to a, a young guy from Maryland and uh, lo and behold, I think it was about a year ago, I get this message from this guy and says, uh, I just, I'm assuming you'd like to know where your kids are at and said, I am a, uh, uh, I teach an orchestra at so-and-so high school in this up east somewhere and said, I have your violin and said, I really like it and so forth and so on. So that meant a lot to me and it is true that this stuff goes out when you sell it. People keep it and enjoy it, put it to good use, but it's also kept and uh, people appreciate, you know, good work wherever it shows up. That's amazing. Yeah, I, um, that, that's a great point by both of you that, um, you know, you, you're really putting yourselves into your instruments. You're putting yourself a little bit of yourself into what you make and, and it becomes something that's bigger but it'll, it'll outlive us all and uh, yeah. pick on a life of its own and um, becomes just like you said, Daniel, that the style of music itself, you know, it's part of a bigger thing than just one yeah. person. It's a community and it's, um, it's a feeling that, that, that it's going to, it's going to have a life of its own. Um, and one, one more point, uh, just before we leave this topic, yeah. I, I persuaded Daniel to put on his label, you know, the one that I made this year, I put the year one of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, I think that'll be another historical uh, note in these instruments that go out over this next two years of this it, uh, pandemic and how it's affected us and all of our lives for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, it'd be, you know, I, I learned about the 1917 and 18 flu from walking up on a cemetery out on a farm one time, you know, of the impact that it had. And I think these instruments will represent that for future generations as something that was made during this time period. Great point. And there's two directions we can go here. I want to talk about the, this moment in history with COVID-19 and the many other things going on in 2020, um, how that is part of how that plays into your apprenticeship right now. Um, you know, you all have been really safe and um, when, you, when you have gotten together, uh, you told me with masks and everything and that you're really cautious about that. Um, but can you talk about um, what it's like learning and teaching the skill um, in the time of COVID-19? I can, I, can, I can answer some of that. Tommy can answer the other half or other part of it. I think um, it's, been, it's been, A, it's been interesting. Um, because of some of the restrictions and things. Um, I know that I work at a college around college students. And so I'm very, very careful about um, who we interact with and how we interact. Cause I know that I don't want to bring anything towards Tommy's home or his family. Um, so we're very much hyper aware of those things and how we work together. Um, but other than that, I, I think what's kind of beautiful about this time is that it's a time for people to reconnect to their, to their hands and to music. Um, and to kind of their themselves. And so uh, I know for me, it, it is funny, you know, we applied for this apprenticeship um, master situation before the pandemic. And so um, 
I know I didn't I say I had like time on my hands by any means, but when the pandemic stuff hit and everything kind of shut down, it was a great moment to be like, where am I going to put this investment like into my time or into my future into like what? Um, and so I think that that's been really good to think about is like learning to do something, play or make something during this time has been great. Um, but I'll tell you one, let, let Tommy talk. And then I got an odd thing I'll bring up about why it's different this time. Okay. Well, uh, you, you know, I, I, I told Daniel, my main thing is being able to be able to see through my glasses with them all fogged up because of my mask, having to wear my mask all the time, you know, and not being able to, one thing you miss as a woodworker, you don't realize <laughs> how many times that you blow dust away from yeah. something and you, you can't blow dust away anymore. And so you're over there with a, you know, a, a brush or something trying to see your work, you know, as you do it. And um, like, like Daniel says, uh, you know, we've tried to be really conscientious about this because my wife and I are both getting up in age and we want to, make it through until the vaccine's here. So we've been isolating and really the only person is Daniel and one other fella uh, from up in Lexington's coming out to the shop every once in a while, Alex Brooks. And uh, those are the only two people we've really been exposed to. Everything else is uh, through a drive-in food window. That's about my only interaction. We haven't even been able to get with our grandkids and our own kids very much. So, and, and the other thing is too, having this process has been a blessing for me because I had already overdosed on cable news and reality shows and so forth. So if I didn't have that shop and this process going on, I'd have probably slipped my throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was gonna bring up news because I think one of the most interesting things that was unexpected about the COVID stuff as well as is, is interesting is I, like Tommy said, he's a little bit of ADD. I'm an ADD guy myself. I always have music going when I'm working or something and some other kind of companion in, you know, in your headspace. Yeah. And, um, and Tommy has a TV in his shop, which is interesting. And so, you know, when you get to know someone and you're, you're kind of like feeling those waters out about stuff, you have no idea what you're going to talk about or, or anything else. And so the TV goes on the first time I'm there and it's like the news. And I'm like, this could be divisive information, like politically, you don't know where people stand. So you kind of test out waters and we find out that we're really similar in almost everything we know we kind of think about. And so we end up listening to stuff and talking about it and going through it. And it's a really great kind of friendship. I feel like, because I've really been able to talk with him through stuff that has been really nice, you know, and, um, so I think if there wasn't as much drama in the outside world, we, we kind of feel, I don't know how Tommy feels about this, but I feel like we're kind of watching it from a distance, you know, like we're definitely being safe and we're a part of what's going on, but all the stuff around it, it's kind of like we watch it and we go, man, okay. And we talk about it, but we feel like it's, we're kind of isolated ourselves, you know? So uh, it's been really nice um, as part of that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a KET junkie. Yeah. listening to all the news programs and antique roadshow and all that junk probably tuned up too loud for these guys probably <laughs> driving crazy but uh i'm i'm good at uh multitasking as far as listening to one thing and doing something else it doesn't yeah. bother me my son he goes nuts you know if i try <laughs> to do two things at once well you guys have naturally come to a, uh, an idea that i wanted to get to which is you know that you have you two um appreciate one another at a, at a deeper level than just what you do as, as artists. Uh, the, you have a relationship, a friendship with one another. And um, if that's, that's often the case with these apprenticeships that you are, um, you know, you're committing to spend time with one another and you're sharing. Yeah. It's not just uh, like art lessons, because that's, that's a different thing, but you're, you're teaching lessons, but you're also um, sharing um, parts of yourself with one another. It's, uh, you're sharing your values and your, um, your um, expressions and your uh, your culture, really. Um, sure. So um, it's yeah, it's great to see. It always as uh, I think that is are, those are the strongest apprenticeships where you know two people are part of the same. They're coming from the same place in that way, and um, that you're you're getting those Daniel's learning the lessons from you, Tommy, and 
um, but he's also getting a sense of uh, you know what you value and um, connecting with that in his own way. Um, now you mentioned uh, the labels uh, earlier and talk talk about the importance of labels in, in violin making and repair because I know as luthiers that's one of the things if you're working on an, uh, like a 150 year old instrument a label is probably going to be pretty important isn't it? Yeah well a label uh, you know especially on the 99 percent of the instruments that you see these old trade instruments that came from germany and so forth they were all that's commercial i mean they were inserted in there and in my situation i probably have never seen an original instrument you know that was made by one of these major families like stradivari or Guarneri or so forth. I did see one Stradivari, original Stradivari violin, cost $1.5 million that I got to hold uh, in the Broke Violin Shop in Cincinnati. That fella up there that owns that shop, he owns one. Wow. But other than that, you know, everybody comes in and they, they bring in their instrument and say, this is original Stradivari or this is so forth. And you hate to say that, but it's not true, you know. There were literally millions and millions of instruments made uh, in the, around the First World War, uh, turn of the century and so forth, and they were made for commercial sale here in the United States. Some of them are different grades. They were either low grade for student instruments or high-end instruments, but the labels that were inserted in them represent maybe a different, a little bit of different form and structure of the instrument. A Stradivari instrument has a different graduation pattern, how, how, how deep or how shallow the top is and so forth. A Guarneri has another feature. So that's one distinction that the label shows up, but really and truly, it's a commercial marketing scheme from the turn of the century to put a label in there to have someone think that they have original Stradivari instrument. So that's my experience with labels, but of course, putting your own, own name in one, you know, like we do, you know, to me has a different perspective. You know, it's just a way um, to um, honor the tradition and to uh, let the owner know who made it and if you ever want to contact them or in our situation, if you'd ever wanted one of your friends would want to buy one that was like the one you own, you know, they know where to come back to. Yeah. Daniel, could you talk about, um, in a sense, I think the way you um, put so much um, like individual expression into your instruments, that, that is kind of labeling it in itself, isn't it? Um, but what are your thoughts on the like labels and, uh, and labeling your work? Well, I think it's complicated. And, and this is something that I've, not to say it's a larger conversation, but um, like I developed over the last, you know, 20 something years, my name as my artistry, you know, so if I have an exhibition, it's under my name, right? And so I remember I got asked to do a craft fair one time and I felt like I couldn't put my name on a cutting board because my name represents something else, you know, um, in my art career. And so I had to come up with like a business name, you know, for all of this like woodworking stuff. And, um, and I thought it was interesting though, because as soon as I knew I was gonna be making a violin, that whole conversation went away and I wanted to put my name in it. Not a business name, not the side name that I put on Instagram or anything like that for woodworking, but my name. And, and the same thing goes for a lot of the other instruments I make. And they, because they become, they represent something art wise that I do or an expression that I do. Um, and because it's kind of who I am, I think that's really kind of interesting because it's not just a cutting board or a, something else. It's actually a tool of expression in itself, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's a complicated, interesting kind of conversation about instruments because just like last night, um, we wrapped up, not wrapped up, but, but primarily set up the violin that I made this semester uh, with Tommy. And he's like, you want to play it first? And I was like, I don't know how to play a violin. Like I'm about to learn because I had to make one to learn, right? That's my thing. And so he played it and I'm like, it sounds fantastic, right? I think. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the one we just finished. So it, 
it was interesting though because one day, this is one day old. Yeah, one day old. It's a newbie. Um, and so, but if he plays it, it sounds like him playing it. And if I played it, it would sound awful, but it'd sound like me playing it, you know? And so it's an interesting thing that you're creating something for someone to express themselves, you know? Um, and so I think that that's why I think the labels become important to me is that uh, you're a translator, you know, you're, you're kind of a conduit for people to be able to play something or to express themselves or just enjoy something. And, um, and so I think it's nice to, to moniker that in some way. Well, now that we have the violin on screen, um, let's talk about that. Um, talk about what, what went into, what are some details as, that you as luthiers um, see that, that the, the, um, the everyday viewer is not gonna notice? Well, I'll say a few things and then Dan can finish up. We, uh, this tone wood for this, which is, uh, of course, all the instruments are maple for the back and for the sides, and then in the, in the scroll in the neck, and then spruce for the top. The, this is um, really European uh, maple and, and spruce uh, that I think came from Bosnia, but the, there's a vendor or a, uh, a tone wood sales outlet in West Virginia, and he orders the logs and then saws them and resells them here in the States. So that's where uh, all of the, the, I mean, the fittings, the chin rest and the fingerboard and, the, and this is all commercially made, just like everything else. Won't be on, probably on his arts version, but for this and the bridge and everything is commercially, but everything else was made from raw wood, from actually a board for the back and the top, which were carved this way and then hollowed out on the inside. And uh, so there was nothing in a kit or, you know, uh, whatever, the neck and the body and the sides were all either bent and or carved from raw wood. So Dan, and, and no one, no one tells you how light a violin is. Once again, I make heavy things, but like, <laughs> It scares me. I'm honest. It scares me because they, they feel super fragile and they feel they're, they're just, I don't know, they stress me out right now, but they, uh, <laughs> the top, the top, it looks like you're like, oh, it's a violin. Yeah. No one recognizes that the top is about the thickness of two dimes, right? So you have to carve it on the outside and then carve it to where you hold it up to the light and it's transparent, like, or translucent. It'll glow. It's so thin. You don't realize how thin those things are. Um, and so being able to measure out within um, a thousandth of an inch, you know, across the whole thing and make it consistent or there's a lot, a lot of detail work. I think the thing that surprised me the most that no one else, I don't think, you know, outside of luthier people would recognize is how specific, and once again, I'm doing it wrong, how specific the woods are. So the top should be spruce and it has to be a certain age and harvested in a certain month of the year, right? So the sap is out of it. Um, and the moisture's out of it. And so they say on a neck, you want it to be at least like five years old and harvested in February. And I'm like, that sounds insane that it's like that specific, you know? Um, but that's what they have. They have this standard in instruments of how stable it has to be from season to season. And in furniture making, it's the same, but it's, it's, it's different tolerances. You know, it's a, it's a moisture content, not an age, but um, for stability. So what they're looking for in the tone, what is the age of it? Um, and as we were discussing last night, that Tommy, talk about what you talked about last night about how um, when you play it, how the instrument changes. Um, uh, that, that's one thing. When when you start out, an instrument really doesn't uh, it doesn't calm down. It sounds really raucous when you start because it's not an instrument. It's just a bunch of independent pieces of wood. But over time, especially the spruce top it'll learn to vibrate. I mean, I, I don't know technically how to talk about it other than I just know it works. That in three months, this instrument will sound completely different than it does now. I mean, it, uh, it sounds, I think it sounds pretty good now. I mean, I told uh, Daniel that it was uh, less raucous than most of them when you first put them together. So I, I have really good hopes for this. 
that how it will sound over time, but uh, there's just an aging process. And of course, that's why a lot of these other, these old instruments that were made in the 1700s and stuff are so valuable because the wood at that time was uh, cut. It was all prime wood. I mean, the aging process, I mean, the growth rings and you can't see it here, but in a piece of spruce are just, I mean, they're almost laid on top of each other, ages for these spruce trees, you know, uh, to, to, to be grown to a size that, can, that, that they can be cut up. So um, it's just, it's just I, I guess it's like whiskey, you know, you make one and the aging process really brings out all kinds of features and, and uh, uh, characteristics uh, that are not there when you just first put it together. Yeah. And Mark, and Mark I'll, I'll add to that. I think, you know, um, I had friends and, and people when I told them I was doing this apprenticeship and I said, it takes a year to make a violin. And they're like, really, it takes a year? And I say, well, no, it takes, you know, four to five months to make it. And then you have to play it while it's unvarnished um, for a few months. So it finds this kind of voice and you have to varnish it. And that takes a whole year. And so a lot of people are really shocked by that. They're like, well, I could buy one off Amazon, like, and have it here in a few days. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, there's something. Oh, really right. with Prime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, but there's something really different, not only about, you know, the individual instrument, because, yeah, you can buy a mass produced one and it probably may sound OK. I don't know. Um, but the issue that, that you made this, that it took a year to make it, it's going to change the sound of it, just like you know, a table that you make that takes you a long time and your family has a thousand meals on, you know, a, a kitchen table that has been through a generation of family is a different table than one that you buy at Ikea. You know, um, there's something about time being put into an object. Um, just like Tommy's violin, the one that you play, you know, that's going to be a different instrument in years because you've played it so much, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, there's even, I, I've never had access to them, but the, to know that an instrument has to be played in, there's people that they have created this uh, box or device that you can connect to the instrument and just leave it and let it vibrate. You know, it's a commercial way of letting the instrument be played in without having to spend the time of actually playing t tunes over and over again to get it to where it's, it gets better in its performance and so forth. Yeah. I love hearing y'all talk about how that, um, sort of the early life of the instrument, how it takes time to develop and, um, and like you mentioned, how they sound raucous at the beginning, Tommy, but they, they settle in or they, they get played in. And, and that's, that's, a, that, um, that's a great detail and, and something that I agree a lot of people wouldn't be aware of if they didn't, um, know the process, um, but um, so after just a few months, you've already completed this um, this much work, Daniel. And do you mind if we hear like a tone or two of that of that violin, so we can hear what it sounds like at this stage of its life, at this early? Yeah, time? you you guys talk about something. Let me make sure it's in tune. In my okay, sure. Um, I'll say I'm glad he's in there with it because he can play it. I can't play it at all. Um, and that's something I'm interested in. You know, like is breaking it in by learning it. Cause I think we're both learning to become instruments, you know, that the violin has to learn how to be played and I have to learn how to play it. And um, so, and I know it's gonna be a long process, but I think it's something interesting to do. Yeah, so probably what we're gonna hear now is more of that raucous sound that Tommy was talking about. And, uh, and eventually you're gonna go through more layers of um, varnishing and coloring, right? And yep. uh, what do you know about that, that upcoming process so far? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Um, as the apprentice of it, I mean, I, I have the understanding of like what we're going to do, um, but actually doing it or, you know, going through it's going to be totally different because that once I think another little tidbit talking about what people don't understand is that to get that look um, of a traditional violin, it's not only layers of glazing or color and varnish, um, but you put it in a box with UV light to actually age the color of the wood. Um, and so there's lots of stuff like that that we'll be going through. Yeah, and um, you know, they, they always said that you can learn how to make a violin, you know, in one year, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to learn how to varnish it properly. And so people don't realize that. 
there is a real, and of course, this is something I'm hoping through Daniel's experience that we'll be able to try some new things because he has so much experience with uh, finishing uh, furniture and so forth. But um, it's a process that every year I think I have it figured out, but then you change something and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's always a trying time as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So let me, um, let me play, uh, I probably messed this up. I have to do one other thing, I'm sorry. I play, I play like a, just a waltz to start out with, maybe one fast tune later. <laughs> dynamics in there and, and uh, I couldn't hear a lot of the details in the tone over the over the zoom call but but yeah. tell me how you tell me how it feels as, as you're playing it what do you what does it feel like well I mean you know I always said a good instrument uh, Daniel was talking about how light they are you'll actually feel it vibrate you know that's a good that's something about it I always think about a good violin uh, if you have a phone in your pocket or something like that uh, you'll you'll feel it even down in your teeth sometimes when you're playing something real deep or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always think that's a sign of a good instrument. You know, the entire box, the whole thing is vibrating. You know, with, with, with. let me play one more little fast tune. This is the uh, girl I left behind me. <laughs> what we'll do is definitely at the end of all this once it's all done um i think we'll do a youtube video of some kind so we can actually pipe in you know audio audio because it doesn't do it justice i can hear it from down here and it sounds fantastic <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful wow that's yeah. um that's great thank you so much for taking uh, a minute to play that for us tommy it's great to hear it in, at this stage and and to to kind of uh, wonder at, at it's it's future what it's going to sound like when when those layers and uh, the varnish and that the colors come out later on and played in like you said yeah very nice um so let's see how's uh how's the, you're almost halfway done with your apprenticeship so far is everything else going okay is there anything that's surprised you two about working together or spending a lot more time together um in the past few months no, everything's good for me. I've really enjoyed the process. And like I say, it's helped with my sanity, you know, over my isolation. That's great. Well, I, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's been great. I've, I'm looking forward to the, to the rest of it for sure. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to playing this thing in and everything else. But uh, I, I, I do think it is interesting to, to, going back to some of our other things about having this be a layered kind of experience of a community. Mm -hmm. um, so like knowing John Reister and knowing Alex Brooks and people that Tommy has worked with already and, and how different we all are, you know, that's been something really interesting to see that from one kind of mentor, we all have totally different approaches to things. 
Um, and, and I think it's just been really so fun to kind of, it sounds funny, but get to know Tommy also through other people. Um, and so that's been really great. So. Yeah, well said. Tommy, is there anything you've uh, learned from Daniel? Sometimes we have a, we talk to our mentors and, and they're like, you know, uh, this, this is just, this is more than a, just a one-way thing. Sometimes the mentors will learn things from the apprentice that they didn't expect. Um, well, they, the main thing is that I have learned how far behind I am <laughs> on the artistry part, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's the, that's the wild thing with him. I mean, in, in Reister, with John and I, we sort of started out at the same level, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with Daniel, he has so much more experience than any of us in, in putting form and function together. So that, that to me is what will be exciting. You know, or, you know, as we see, if he makes some more instruments, what they look like and how they sound. So that's that. Uh, that and, and through this varnishing process, I'm serious about this, that he may have some experience, uh, you know, that I don't as far as coloring, because that's something uh, usually people you, you buy a Chinese instrument and it'll be just white like this and it'll just have plain old varnish, you know, big, thick varnish. And there's a real artistry in being able to color them and, and, and really improve the appearance and somewhat antique them, you know, to where they look like they're worn a little bit around the edges and so forth. That's what really makes a nice instrument and commercially to be able to sell one. Because most people, they look at an instrument, you know, they got these kids instruments that are painted pink and all these colors, wild colors. I understand that to get them to get engaged, but a professional instrument for an adult, they want it to look nice and they want it to be varnished properly. So it's a, it's a real challenge and I'm looking forward to that in the spring when we do that with this work. Well, likewise, I'm excited about what, what you all have done so far and what you've talked with us about today. Um, and uh, Daniel, I'm uh, eager to, to to see you know where you where you take this uh, apprenticeship, it's uh, it's amazing to see your visual um, like the the visual elements of the instruments that you make, and and to and to put that together with the tone of the instruments is uh, is something I think that's really uh, amazing that you're bringing to this tradition. Um, and uh, as you're both aware, um, folk traditions aren't really something that's that is meant to be like locked down, like something that happens one way forever. But instead, it has to have a life of its own in order to to survive and thrive over generations. And so I think y'all's apprenticeship is a great example of that. So, um, you know, you're, um, you're working within a traditional art form, but you're bringing something new to it, um, each one of you individually. And um, it's, it illustrates the, the real dynamics um, of, of violin making and, and, other, and other art forms in Kentucky too, like related to what you all do with music, um, how, how music takes on a new life and with each generation. So um, uh, I was uh, amazed by all the, um, uh, all the cultural values that you all talked about um, developing together over time, like your ideas of um, uh, resourcefulness, uh, your do-it-yourself kind of spirit. Uh, I think these are things that you all have in common that, that you've talked about today. And um, your, your sort of adventurousness in trying something new. Um, and getting to know people so that you can figure out what, what you can learn from them. Um, and that you, you have this awareness too of, of the importance of what you're making and what you put into it. It's gonna, it's gonna have a life of its own. It's gonna, it's gonna um, outlive, a, it's gonna outlive us all and, uh, and take on um, real significance, I think. And, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I think at this at this moment to be able to talk to you in the middle of your apprenticeship that that's something really valuable um, for me to hear and I, and I know that the rest of the audiences will will enjoy hearing this as well. So with with those things in mind, um, what else uh, do you want people to know about your apprenticeship and that we haven't talked about so far? Is there anything that um, uh, you know you you want as as insiders to your um, mentorship that you want? Uh, other people to understand about what you're doing right now. Making these things is hard. That's uh, what <laughs> it's understated, but like to make something well is not easy. 
and it takes time. Um, and to make something look simple is even harder, you know? Um, in a lot of instruments you can hide, like there are places where you can get sloppy. In these instruments, there's not really those places to hide. If, you, if you're not on top of your game in that way, if you don't make it the best you possibly can, it shows everywhere. And, um, and so I think there's actually more than you realize that a lot of people realize is that there's a sense of vulnerability in making something and putting it out there for people to play or see. And, um, and so I think that making these things is, is more involved than people realize. And so it's, it's, it is related more to art in terms of, of, of putting yourself and being vulnerable because once you make something and you share it, um, that's one thing, but then for a mentor and a mentee to like, he's taking something that he's made and he's sharing what he knows. And then I have to take that and, and create my own thing and share what I know. Like it, it becomes a very like, you know, intimate kind of process in some capacity. It's not so, you know, show up and do a lesson like you said earlier. It's not like a, you're learning these steps. Um, I'm not learning how to make a violin. I'm learning how Tommy Case makes a violin. You know what I'm saying? And that's very different. And I think that's really powerful to know that that's how it comes down. And so if I teach someone how to make a violin, like I'm not actually, let's rephrase that. I'm not learning how to make Tommy, Tommy Case violin. I'm learning how to make a violin that was taught to Tommy Case by Bill Huckabee, by someone else. That, that it all kind of comes into it, you know? Um, so making these things is hard and very kind of complicated, not just technically. Yeah, it's, it, to me, it's bringing it with an instrument, it's form and function that you're bringing those together. That the cosmetic part, that's great if you get the cosmetics and they really look nice, but if it doesn't sound nice. And so it's that balance that you want to, to bring forward. The other thing too, um, almost anybody, you can buy, you can go online and you can see outlines on how to make a violin. There's a lot of great, great resources. But I think Danny will agree with this, that there's little tips and techniques involved with each step. And that's what I hope that I pass on to them. Okay, yeah. if, you're, if you're carving the top, okay, that's simple, it looks well, but the technique that you're able to convey through orally being there with them and helping them, you know, helps them understand that step so that you know, it sticks in your head. And then the next time, and what that does, it saves you from making mistakes and improves your skills because you were exposed to the techniques to do the step, just not knowing that that needs to be done. So uh, uh, there, there's a whole lot of difference in that, I think. Yeah, great point. And, and as the apprentice, Daniel, you probably um, uh, have, have I, I mean, I'm sure as, as an experienced artist um, in other ways, um, learning can be a really active process, can't it? Sometimes knowing what questions to ask and, and trying to figure out what your, your teacher is doing or what they're paying attention to can be um, part of the lesson, right? Yeah, and it's a real humbling process because I, I thought this was important to do for myself, not only because of learning, but to become a student again, mm -hmm. you know, at any age or whatever else. Um, it's humbling because I, I could go into Tommy's shop and I'm like, I know every tool in here when it comes to woodworking, like I could do it. But then I feel like I'm like, but I don't know how to do the next thing. You know, like I'm, I'm ready to go. Like I, I got this, I know how to do this. Let me cut it out. And he's like, but you gotta look five steps ahead. And I'm like, right. So it's teaching me again to slow down and, and not rush. And it's also teaching me, you know, once again, you don't know everything ever. You know, that's a beautiful thing that like, I could be a woodworker for two decades and not know a darn thing about how to make a violin, even though it's a wooden object, you know? Um, they're just two totally different craft forms. And so, yeah, being a student and, uh, and learning again is just fantastic. That's great. Well, any other, any other thoughts or uh, kind of closing ideas you'd like to share before we wrap up? Tommy, I see you're holding uh, up. One, yeah, one thing, uh, th this, is, this is called a dance master violin. It's a pocket violin. And uh, Daniel, we've been talking and collaborating uh, in possibly trying to make another one of these um, that looks like a boat. So maybe by the end of the apprenticeship, 
<laughs> that we'll have 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 one that's, that's structured like this. This was one I made back several years ago, and the the legacy is I did I did not carve the scroll. Okay, this image on here I outsourced that to China, but uh, I did install it in the neck. But um, you know th this form is uh, Stradivari actually made these instruments. And what they were in, uh, what they're, they were called dance master violins, because as I understand it, these dance instructors would walk between different communities and teach folk dancing to uh, kids in, in these villages. And so rather than carrying a big violin, they had these things and they wore big coats and they would slide them down in the pocket in their coat and go from one, one place to the other. And it wasn't meant to make beautiful music. It was to the rhythm and so forth to the folk dance that they played. But there was, if you look on the internet, you'll see a lot of artistry, you know, and decoration on these style instruments. So I had some uh, special wood, some quilted maple. And so I'm gonna try to make another one of these and he'll be involved in, in uh, uh, the form part. Uh, I'll try to do the function, he can do the form in, the, in mm -hmm. decoration and so forth, uh, maybe by the end of the apprenticeship. Yeah, that's great. When you said pocket violin, I, I was imagining, because it was named that because it was portable, and then you said you, because you actually put it in your pocket and travel down the road with it. Yeah, and even some of the ones, the original ones, this was, this is made on a standard scale, what they call a four by four. It's an adult instrument as far as the, the notes and stuff. But some of the other ones, they were made, they were really short and some of them only had three strings on them. So it was just, just, just to play very basic tunes. But uh, anyway, it's just another form of violin. And there's a, there's a lot, several people making them out on the internet. And some of them are real fancy as far as the forms go and so forth, or the look of it. Yeah, it's exciting to hear Daniel's kind of initial response to that form was like a, was you, you imagined a boat or like the connections to a boat? Is that, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I told him it's, it's been really fun to kind of talk through it and I keep wanting to push him faster and harder to do it and do it. Um, He's like, well, I'm thinking this. I'm like, don't think it. Just like, go and do it, you know, because he has the skill set to do it. And um, but it, it's it's been really fun because I think the pocket violin is so fascinating to me. I saw one. A guy made one basically just out of a box, and I was like, oh, I can make a box. And I was like, I know how to make a violin neck. Like, <laughs> I can make one this weekend. You know, you kind of like get excited and panic. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I think you know the boat one, the way he's been talking about it, and the way he's been thinking through it, and we've been talking through it. It's really exciting. Right. Well, it's, it's exciting to hear kind of what, what inspires uh, both of you as, you as you're working together. And um, I, I just want to congratulate you on your uh, apprenticeship. I think this is, uh, this is exciting to see this unfold. And um, the Arts Council is proud um, to be a sponsor of this. And um, we hope that you all uh, will keep in touch with us as you proceed. And, um, and that uh, if, if you're, um, anytime you need assistance or uh, want to look at, um, you know, make other connections throughout the Commonwealth, let me know. And um, I hope the, the audience is, uh, has been enjoying this and, and we're going to try to figure out a way to answer their questions when we um, broadcast this. So maybe if one of you all could be online when we, when we actually play this um, uh, as part of our Creative Industry Summit series, um, I think it'd be cool to have that kind of interactive element um, sure. But I'm, I'm, um, I'm really grateful to both of you for spending time with me today and going in depth. And um, any other questions or thoughts uh, as we wrap up here? Good. Good to go. Okay. Well, thanks again, Tommy Case and Daniel Graham. Congratulations once again on your Lutheran apprenticeship. And we look forward to keeping in touch with you and, um, and, and wish you the best as we move into 2021. All right.